Hello friends, welcome to Be Waste Wise. I am Shweta, I am the community builder at Be Waste Wise. And uh, before we start with the panel, I'd like to start off with mentioning, I hope all of you are doing well, all of you are doing safe at the face of what is a very weird time at this particular point in time. I hope you and your family is uh, safe and indoors and I hope we get past everything that's happening uh, sooner than later. And uh, moving on, today we're gonna, our panel is on single-use plastics and extended producer responsibility in India. This panel is organized in partnership with Administrative Staff College of India. So in, and we have Kaushik Chandrasekhar, who is an assistant professor at ASCII, who is today's moderator. And Kaushik is going to be talking to Dipali Sinha Khetriwal, who is the managing director at Sufis India. Uh, we also have Shailendra Singh from All India Plastic Manufacturers Association. And we have Pankaj Arora, who is an associate director at a leading consulting firm in India. And we did receive your questions during when you registered itself. And we've ensured the questions have been passed on to the panelists and their notes includes responses to your questions. However, during the course of the conversation, we know we all get questions. So please feel free to share your questions. Use the Q&A section that you will find on Zoom to share your questions because uh, Kaushik will be posing these questions to the panelists. So I'm not going to be taking any more uh, time. I am handing this over to Kaushik. So over to you. Thank you, Shweta. Um, thank you for the quick introduction. Uh, good afternoon, all. Uh, thank you all for joining us uh, today on this webinar on uh, single-use plastics and extended producers' responsibility. As we all know, uh, this is turning into a significant part of municipal solid waste management in India. Uh, the webinar, uh, as, as, as discussed, is an initiative hosted by Administrative Staff College of India, ASCII, in partnership with Be Waste Wise. Uh, I must acknowledge that uh, we've received an outstanding response to this webinar in terms of registrations from participants from various domains and across continents. Uh, we thought we would also, for the convenience of our panelists, uh, display the profile split of our participants today. So I'll quickly share my screen, uh, which will show you the profile split. Yeah, so the COVID pandemic um, has actually given us the right window to introspect and a unique opportunity to re revisit our approaches to various situations. Uh, it is during these times of emergencies that uh, we've evolved and kind of set better benchmarks. Uh, the pandemic has uh, almost already got us to the forefront of understanding the need of an enhanced push for better hygiene and sanitation systems. Today's webinar on single-use plastics and EPR targets at exploring practical approaches for achieving regulatory industry connect to the concept of circularity and resource efficiency during these times. Uh, just to give you an idea, India generates close to 26,000 tons of plastic uh, waste and, and, and much of it actually revolves around packaging. Uh, the call for the phase out of single use plastics in India has demonstrated a clear political will uh, towards uh, addressing this issue. However, there is still a need for a holistic assessment of the roadmap as well as the phase out plan for which you know, the, the implement, implementation roadmap has to be taken into account. As, as India takes a leap towards phase out of single use plastics, the states and the cities have uh, taken multiple initiatives ranging from uh, blanket bans to curbs on uh, single use plastic usage. Uh, there have also been uh, attempts to engage with producers, manufacturers, brand owners through the mechanism of extended producers responsibility. However, the resurgence of single-use plastics in these COVID times, owing to hygiene concerns, has threatened these efforts. The interesting thing, though, that there is very little evidence that single-use plastics is any safer. The research done, however, has shown that the coronavirus can survive in most of the surfaces, including plastics, for about two to three days. Before I hand over the floor to my experts, uh, I would mention that uh, uh, you know, there are a few key takeaway points for all our audience today. The purpose of this webinar is to give a comprehensive perspective on 
uh, phasing out of single-use plastics and operationalizing EPR, including discussions on what are the next steps that cities could take to phase out single-use plastics? What are the factors we would be revisiting leading to an improved EPR implementation strategy? To tell us more on this, I would like to invite our experts for the day, Ms. Deepali Sena Ketriwal from Sophie's India, Mr. Shailendra Singh from All India Plastic Manufacturers Association, and Mr. Pankaj Arora from a leading consulting firm. So we will start with some opening remarks from each of our panelists, followed by uh, a question answer session. Uh, to better address your queries, like, uh, uh, like it was mentioned earlier, we have crowdsourced questions from the webinar registrations. Uh, we would try and cover as many questions as possible during this session. Uh, we would then address the rest of the queries using email via, uh, uh, you know, within a week. Uh, to ensure smooth transition of the webinar, you know, we've muted the audio and disabled the video for our participants. You can, however, send in your questions using the Q&A section on the bottom corner. Uh, with this, I would like to begin with Pankaj. Uh, Pankaj, the concept of single-use plastics in India has been a bit overwhelming. Uh, definitions, alternatives, uh, ban or no ban, what should the government's approach be? Uh, please decode this for us. Thank you, Kaushik. Thank you, Shweta. Glad to be here and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, first of all, uh, I mean, the current crisis that we are facing. So thank you to all the government representatives. I saw some representation from government. Uh, some of the, you might be a doctor, healthcare worker, sanitation worker. So thank you all. And uh, our, I think uh, everybody will uh, put our condolences to whatever has happened in uh, Vizag today with the gas leak. Uh, so uh, uh, a word of prayer for them. So with that, uh, I'll take this forward. Uh, so uh, looking at, uh, I, I think uh, before we dig deeper on the definition piece, I, I would uh, like to actually start with the, uh, the regulations aspect uh, first. So looking at, uh, uh, Kaushik, if you could move to the next one, please. So if you look at uh, the Indian history of uh, the plastic and especially the regulation piece, it's, it has started, it's been more than 20 years now when the first uh, plastic uh, uh, regulation came out in 1999. And uh, that was more so related to uh, elimination of single use polythene bags with the size and thickness. So uh, it's been more than two decades that we have been trying to address this issue. And uh, we certainly have made progress and we are learning on the way, but still a long way to go. This followed up in 2003, where uh, the export oriented industry was exempted uh, and to improve the further enforcement. And in 2011, uh, this was further strengthened and, to, and uh, uh, the plastic thickness was increased from 20 microns to 40 microns and municipal authorities were given the responsibility to set up the system, especially on the lines of the EPR. I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, all of you would be uh, uh, gearing to learn more about that, but uh, it's been more than 10 years that we are also trying to work on the extended producer responsibility. However, uh, uh, I mean, as far as the implementation is gone uh, in 2016, this was further strengthened, but still we made our EPS system slightly more complex and I'm pretty sure uh, Shalindraji and uh, Deepali would uh, do a good job in terms of untangling that complexity. Uh, in 2018, uh, the amendment were introduced and as part of those amendments, uh, some of the user fee which were introduced in 2016 were taken away. Now, uh, if you look at, uh, if uh, many of you would have uh, kind of looked at the Indian plastic waste management rules, you will find it very interesting that uh, there is no uh, terminology called single use plastic in there, uh, which we are trying to address and hopefully you would have some answers today. And the second piece is uh, the EPR. So there are only two mentions of extended producer responsibility in all of the uh, rules. Moving towards next, uh, I think it's very important to uh, look at what single-use plastic is. Next slide, please. So uh, if you go by the dictionary definition, it's really simple that are used only once and thrown away. Uh, United Nations Environment Program, they, uh, they have uh, come up with the, their own set of definition, which is related to plastic packaging, and it includes uh, uh, the grocery bag, the food packaging. However, interestingly, in India, because center has not defined a clear-cut definition of single-use plastic and sanitation and waste management being a state matter, it's, it's a federal 
uh, matter. Uh, so considering that every state has come up with their own set of uh, terminology or definition for single-use plastic. If you look at UP, here I've tried to cover uh, and give you two, three examples. So if you look at the, the UP uh, there, it's all kind of carry bags, dis disposable cutleries, etc. However, interestingly, Maharashtra in 2018 came up with one of the most stringent uh, plastic waste management rules, um, and they divided into three parts. So first part is uh, the single-use plastic, which is banned. The second part is where uh, EPR can come in uh, and uh, the aspect, uh, especially the recyclable plastic. And the third part is, which is exempt, for example, the plastic which is uh, used by the medical fraternity or health matters uh, and uh, uh, for medicines, etc. Kerala most recently have come up uh, and defined uh, a single use plastic, more particularly uh, defining it with the carry bags. They all, interestingly also included non woven bags, which was so far not been included in other uh, plastic waste management rules or definition. Plastic sheets, uh, bottle sizes, uh, uh, less than 500 ml plastic garbage bags, and so forth. So, here the point is that unless we have a clear cut definition, it's very difficult to address the problem. So we'll look at what can be done uh, in terms of the plastic uh, uh, waste management rules and how we can define a single use plastic. I think uh, we'll address that during the course of uh, this session. Uh, moving towards uh, the next bit, which is um, nowadays there is uh, a lot of talk about uh, single use plastic bans. And last year, our Honorable Prime Minister also uh, basically addressed this issue and uh, uh, there was an announcement made by 2022, we would like to move towards uh, plastic, uh, single-use plastic ban. So before we move towards that, we need to first actually define the problem. And uh, we also need to look at how other countries are tackling it, concerns. So moving next, please. So if you look at uh, the breakup of uh, the 60 countries where the plastic bans uh, has been, uh, or Levi's has been uh, put in on the single-use plastic. Uh, I think one of the uh, graphs uh, mentioned is not there, but I'll just say that lack, uh, due to lack of information, there is no clear-cut information whether it has helped or not. Uh, for 20% cases, uh, there is no change, while the piece which is not being shown in the uh, slide right now, which is the 30%, it has actually reduced uh, the consumption of plastic. So uh, definitely there could be an impact, but it has to be, so only plastic ban will not help. Uh, you, you need uh, enabling factors, uh, such as the right policy measures, uh, the availability of alternatives, and we are going to talk about it during the session uh, to make a plastic ban uh, especially useful. Can we move to the next, please? Now, looking at the impact of the plastic ban, we also need to address uh, how it is going to have a socioeconomic impact. Um, in the Indian uh, recycling industry, and uh, you, you might already know that it's a very much informal driven, um, and uh, it ranges right from the raw material uh, of and the polymer production to the actual disposal and the end of life treatment. Uh, plastic industry in India has uh, uh, grown from 80, 85 lakh ton in 2007 to 1.78 lakh tons in 2017. So it has been tremendous uh, uh, lifestyle change uh, over the last decade and a half. And uh, uh, the, the majority of the aspects, which is the plastic manufacturing, uh, where uh, the majority of the employment is happening and the processing and the actual disposal and land. There are estimated that uh, you know more than uh, 5 million people uh, actual life uh, livelihood actually depend on this so before we directly move towards the ban and we make that shift of completely stopping we also need to provide an alternative livelihood options for these people um, and look at the socioeconomic impact how it's going to impact our day to day life so we're going to talk about during this session but uh, I'm pretty sure EPR is going to play a very important role. And uh, with that, uh, I would hand it over to Koshik and uh, Mr. Shalindraji to take us forward. Uh, thank you, Pankaj, for those insights on uh, the need for defining single-use plastics in a clear manner, uh, rather to you know, define it to get a better understanding. Uh, Shailendraji, uh, the, the Plastic Waste Management Rules 2016 
defines EPR as uh, the responsibility of a producer for the sound environment management of a product until the end of the life. So how does, how do you see this mechanism evolving in our country? Uh, if you could share some thoughts on that. Shalindraji, you have to unmute yourself. Yeah, sorry, I was uh, muted. Uh, thank you, Shweta, for unmuting me. Uh, as I was saying, many thanks to uh, ASCII and to B Wastewise for inviting me for this webinar. I'd also like to second Pankaj's thoughts around the people who are suffering uh, in today's world uh, today due to the pandemic. And my thoughts, particularly apart from the you know hospital and medical workers, uh, also go to the migrant laborers. Uh, I think they are suffering the most. Uh, particularly when you look at, you know, even from a waste management perspective, uh, several of these rag pickers and waste pickers live on daily wages. Uh, let me also qualify that some of the views that I'm going to express are my personal views and may not necessarily be that of IPMA. Uh, lastly, uh, let me also take this opportunity to wish everyone a very happy Buddha Purnima. And today also happens to be the birthday of uh, Sri Ravindranath Tagore, both giants from India who continue to influence and teach us even today. Coming to your question, really the operative phrase, uh, Kaushik, is you know PWM emphasizes EPR, and the other one is of course, how will this mechanism ev evolve? Uh, you'd be surprised to know uh, that in the PWM 2016 amended 2018, the word EPR actually comes only once or twice in a 20 page document. Um, and uh, so, you know, one, one really has to think about what is the emphasis around uh, EPR as we so commonly um, talk about. Could you move to the next slide, please? Yeah, I'd just like to take a moment uh, to give you an overview of what IPMA does. We are a 73-year-old organization uh, set, uh, set up by visionaries. There are several activities that we are involved in. Uh, whether it's in uh, policy making, advocacy, waste collection drives, working with NGOs. Um, we even do some voluntary EPR work for some of our smaller members. Uh, some numbers were referred to in Pankaj's earlier slide. Uh, workshops and seminars, we have done a couple of them uh, centered around EPR and how do we improve the environment. For more information, you can log on to their website. Um, but I'd, I'd also like to mention that IPMA is just transforming from just being an association to also being a learning organization. So we have just set up a technical education center and we have been granted uh, innovation center approval by Niti Aayog, which we are going to set up in Gurgaon and in Bombay. Next slide, please. Yeah, just a thought here in terms of, you know, we keep talking about plastic waste and there's a lot of uh, stuff in the media about uh, how much plastic is in the ocean. And I don't mean to discount that by any standards, but uh, you have to look at this in the context of solid waste. Uh, one needs to understand that there is a formal and an informal value chain. And that currently it's the informal value chain that does a lot of the recovery of, uh, of plastics as, it's uh, as it is uh, today. One also a uh, quick reminder here that uh, as far as PET bottles, and this may be very interesting to some of the international audience, that uh, you know PET bottle recovery started in India two decades ago. Uh, they are being recovered and converted into polyester fiber. And this has largely been due to the spirit of the Indian entrepreneur and not as much of uh, because of any rules or regulations. So uh, the point I want to make here is, you know, let's not uh, think about it as a waste. Uh, it's more of a resource. Next slide, please. I'm sure, uh, you know, everyone's wondering where are we on, on this? What's the India status? And I'm sorry, the next couple of slides, I've got a lot of words on it, but I couldn't figure out how else to do this. Some of what you see here on this slide is actually taken uh, from an action taken report that was submitted uh, to the National Green Tribunal um, by uh, various ministries. And so some of these are verbatim quotes uh, since it's a, sorry, it's a publicly available uh, document. Uh, you can see that 
uh, even within the uh, government, there is a little disappointment in terms of how um, it has it has evolved and how it has worked. Uh, several uh, multi-stakeholder uh, uh, discussions have happened um, uh, in terms of you know arriving uh, at a uh, at a policy that addresses all the situation, uh, all the uh, concerned stakeholders in the value chain. Um, what I'd also like to uh, mention here is that whilst the overall picture may appear to be broken and that several disconnects exist and gaps need to be filled, there have been some positives too. Uh, large manufacturers of plastics, for example, uh, you know, the um, IOCs and reliances of the world are in the background developing an ecosystem which will support and upgrade uh, the recycling technology and capacity in India. Many entrepreneurs have entered into plastic waste management. They begin to realize what the deal really is. Several innovative applications have been developed. For example, waste to board, waste uh, uh, into road making. Um, largely, these are end of life applications. There's a renewed interest in pyrolysis. And there's also a lot of talk in terms of upgrading and action on the ground of upgrading recycling uh, capabilities. Government realized that you know, the recycling capacity needs to be boosted. So many recycling units who were not given a consent to operate were uh, in the last uh, six months, several of them were granted the consent to operate. Uh, several organizations in particular UNDP are working. Uh, many, many municipalities are beginning to work uh, in terms of setting up a material recovery facility as they are called. And, and many of these actions, by the way, have already been outlined in the Solid Waste Management 2016 rules. Having said all of that, we still have a long way to go. Next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah, so uh, I think the next question is, you know, uh, how will this evolve? What are, what's going on? So as you will notice right at the top, these are proposed frameworks. The first framework is about a model rather is about setting up a e EPR corpus fund at the central and the state level. And, and, and again, sorry for all the words there, but what this really means is based on your plastic consumption, uh, brand owners would be uh, asked to pay a certain sum uh, and an escrow account would be created. Uh, and then there would be several uh, representatives from brand owners, from state bodies who would uh, own this uh, escrow account and then allocate these resources to projects that help build infrastructure, create awareness, uh, build recycling capacity, so on and so forth. Um, as we as we uh, look at this framework, and I can assure the audience that uh, several uh, constituents of the uh, value chain inputs were taken. There were several meetings. Uh, many uh, uh, organizations like CII, ASOCAM, FICI, IPMA, and even brands presented their views, and and uh, so a lot of discussion has taken place. Again, uh, as we delve into this. Uh, there are a couple of things I'd like everyone to, uh, to sort of think about as we look at this topic. Um, India probably is one of the handful countries where there is actually the existence of a national green tribunal. This was set up in 2010 and was meant to adjudicate on legal cases arising out of implementation of environment laws. Do you know what the principles of this uh, body uh, are and they are enshrined in the document? They talk surprisingly about sustainable development and about polluter pay principle. The second thing I want to, the audience to also remember is that a detailed uh, solid waste management rule was written in 2016. It's a very comprehensive document. If you haven't read it, please do read it. Uh, and then of course, there's an awakening in the consumer's mind about companies and how their actions impact the environment. All of us remember our prime minister's speech and for a period of August to October last year, you know, everyone that I turned to was talking about plastic waste and what they could do to help the scenario. Next slide, please. The second model that's also been again proposed uh, is much more or less like how things are going on now, um, where uh, essentially the EPR compliances uh, would be met uh, through producer responsibility organizations 
or uh, even you know if brands wanted to do it on their own what i think will happen again this is a proposed stuff and not not approved yet that eventually there will be a blend of model 1 and model 2 uh, in some of the meetings that i was present i can tell you that there was uh, i would say large uh, acceptance that a blend of blend of model 1 and model 2 would possibly be the way forward um, there is a question around data secrecy so there's a need to build a portal where uh, data can be uh, protected uh, as they submit from individual brands and the accounting of how much plastic comes back is appropriately done uh, of course uh, the, the uh, details about who will bear the cost and how much uh, that wasn't uh, discussed at least in the ones in the meetings that i was present at uh, i don't know what the final shape uh, of the policy is i know that it's lying at the ministry but it will have some of these elements that you see up on the slides uh, next slide please so um, i i put this up uh, that you know as we debate and uh, sometimes castigate um, uh, the way things are happening in India. Uh, you know, there are, uh, you know, good, what does good look like models right here? Uh, city of Indore and a smaller town called Ambikapur in Chhattisgarh. Uh, if if uh, you're not aware, please do read this. Uh, read the success stories of how things have happened there. Uh, Indore, of course, has been now even quoted, I believe, in the United Nations. As, a, as an example that other countries in the world could learn from. Um, what I'd like also the audience to think about is that as Indians, you know, we are not new to recycling. We are not new to the concept of treating a resource as a resource. Many of you remember how we recycle newspapers. I do when I was a child and used to look forward uh, to the pocket money that, I, that my mother gave me after she sold the newspapers collected over a couple of months. PET bottles to polyester fiber is another great story. Um, so uh, it can be done. I think that's the point I'm trying to make. Uh, if you read the story about Ambikapur, it's, a, it's an inspirational story. But what comes across is that in each case, there was a shared vision. There was proactive city leadership. There was inclusion, smart execution, uh, were sort of the cornerstones of the success. So success begets success. And now, you know, I can tell you several brands want to be associated with these success stories. Next slide, please. Yeah, this is my last slide. And this is a little bit to leave uh, everyone <clears throat> kind of thinking uh, about, uh, isn't it time we change the paradigm? I mean, in the past, what have we learned uh, unfortunately, you know, uh, it shouldn't have been a, pan a pandemic, but it has given some, uh, some of us an opportunity to pause and think. What I'd like the audience to also consider is um, it's not waste, it's a resource. It's not just about compliance to a law. It's about ownership of a problem. It's not their problem. It's our problem. We need to collaborate across different stakeholders. It's not an EHS sustainability function. It's a CEO and board discussion point. We are not just looking at packaging cost competitiveness. We are looking at sustainable development. It's not about consumer awareness. It's much more about consumer action. So uh, it can't be done. Uh, I hear this in many of my engagements. And I can tell you models already exist in India. You don't have to look far. We need to get collaborative. We need to get resource recovery conscious. And we need to start thinking about circularity and how to develop a viable ecosystem. There is no better time than to do this now. Thank you, and uh, over to you, Kaushik. Thank you, Shalendraji. Uh, uh, the inputs on uh, EPR national policy framework were really insightful. Um, uh, I, would, I would want to bring Dipali in here. Dipali, the plastic waste rules uh, have little detailing on EPR, as Shalendraji mentioned and uh, the models uh, for implementation that would have to be followed. Uh, what do we have to learn from the international experience? Uh, could, you, could you share some thoughts, please? Uh, thank you to, uh, you know, Kaushik, uh, you know, for setting the, the stage as such and, you know, for the 
input from Pankaj and Chalendra ji before because I think uh, you know they brought up some of you know the main points, the key words, uh, you know the terminology which has been uh, kind of evolving and developing over the last uh, two decades more or less, uh, you know uh, internationally and you know certainly also in India. You know if you look at the developing country emerging economies kind of context uh, india is is pretty well placed and you know is is in many ways uh, at the front of the pack when it comes to you know adopting these very progressive frameworks of epr and you know being able to uh, you know have legislation specifically targeted at specific uh, waste streams and if you look internationally uh, there is a whole kind of uh, sea of uh, experience, uh, you know, starting uh, from, you know, the very, very early days of EPR, uh, you know, being conceptualized and then, you know, being implemented, uh, you know, through legislative uh, and uh, non-legislative, uh, you know, voluntary frameworks as well, uh, back in the 1990s. And then this was, you know, really coming uh, from the perspective of, okay, you know, we have an environmental problem, uh, you know, our landfills are getting full, how do we reduce the waste going to landfill? Uh, you know, what could be, uh, you know, opportunities to divert landfill uh, to other, other um, processing and treatment? Uh, and then, of course, uh, you know, there were budget constraints and, you know, in developing economy, uh, in developed economies, uh, you know, there were, uh, more pressures on municipal budgets and so the epr framework was then brought in to address some of those challenges and of course as you know it was also mentioned it is based on the polluter base principle where you kind of say okay if you're using the product you're benefiting from it you should take care that it is also uh, you know not uh, being a hazard across its life cycle not just uh, you know while you're using it or before but you know even at the end of life and then this led to the modernization of the waste management sector, uh, you know, which is also something that Shailen uh, hinted about, where there is now the drive, there is the funding, there is the mechanisms to really create those in India as well through these frameworks, uh, you know, and, and this is helping to streamline, to integrate, uh, you know, different uh, waste management uh, actors. And then there was a question on, you know, uh, the, the Q&A chat uh, regarding the informal sector, which is, of course, you know, currently handling it, uh, handling a large part of uh, waste, uh, you know, in India. And, and there are ways and means to incentivize them through these kind of funding mechanisms as well and integrate them into, uh, you know, this modern waste management sector as such. And over time, this has moved, uh, you know, from just being about the environment and, and kind of uh, waste to bringing it much more in the context of um, uh, the regulatory standards, uh, you know, in terms of uh, workers and, you know, what would be treatment standards and very uh, much more in the closed loop kind of mindset of the circular economy. So this is how the international experience has been evolving. And I think, uh, you know, there are some things that are still kind of missing in the Indian uh, objectives of, you know, the PWM, uh, it does capture a lot, uh, you know, but I think uh, some of the implementation leaves some gaps and, you know, uh, potential to improve. So maybe if we can move to the next slide, uh, you know, the concept of PPR is very broad and very flexible. And uh, Chalindraji already mentioned that, you know, there could be like hybrid and, you know, multiple ways to implement this, uh, you know, there is the state fund model, uh, which is, you know, for example, uh, through an echo levy, and this is currently in, in Ghana and China uh, operational. And this would be what, you know, was mentioned that, you know, you have a, an escrow account where, you know, producers pay in uh, a, a fixed fee. It's, it's an echo levy or an eco fee or a recycling fee. You can call it whatever. It's basically something that goes into a ring fenced account that is then used to finance, you know, all the various parts and channels uh, of, you know, the, the ecosystem. So whether it's collection, aggregation, storage, treatment, depollution, shredding, uh, sorting, uh, recycling, etc. Another way to do it is through the PRO model. That's a producer responsibility organizational model. And this is very common. Uh, it's got a long history in Europe and now becoming popular even in other countries, including in, in India. Uh, there are uh, a lot of PROs, uh, you know, in India on e-waste, uh, you know, which is what I work quite a lot on and, and with. Um, and of course, also on plastics, you know, there was a little bit of a back and forth on this. So uh, it's a little bit of a gray area to call a PRO a PRO right now in India. But yeah, it, the, 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 the 
organizations, the interface exists, you know, to be the uh, connection between uh, the producer on the one hand, uh, who has the obligation, who has the responsibility through the EPR framework, and then, you know, the, the operational side, which is, you know, to collect and to recycle and to manage those relationships. Can be a bit in between model as well. Uh, I've only seen one example of it, and it's in, in Taiwan, which has a state run PRO. So, it's an independent body, which is uh, it's, it's government owned, but it has a, an independent mandate. So, uh, that's a little bit between a hybrid between a PRO, a traditional PRO, which is owned by the PRO or by the producers, and the state fund, which is you know run by the state. Two other models are a market-driven model, which is, you know, much more uh, prevalent in um, Germany and to some extent in Australia, which is really, you know, uh, pushing towards, you know, market uh, dynamics, uh, helping and, and, you know, working to create those uh, infrastructures and incentives to collect and recycle more and better. This requires immense amounts of uh, coordination and trust. And, you know, you do have a lot of... Uh, centralization of information and then you know you have uh, to allocate responsibility etc so it's not a very popular model because it, it requires a lot of um, yeah you know coordination and management and administration and uh, of course uh, you know you you have an even more hyper competitive model in the uk uh, where you have uh, an evidence note trading system and you can trade notes on on your obligations etc so these are more when there is legislation in place. You can also do an EPR implementation without having legislation. And this is, you know, more voluntarily uh, in the case of, uh, you know, companies who want to do the right thing, who have, you know, the commitment to do, uh, you know, their take back and collection even beyond the need and obligation of a legislation. And this is where you see, you know, them contracting directly with recyclers. And, you know, we see this in many countries, uh, producers in Kenya, in, in South Africa, especially, uh, they've set up PROs and, you know, they have uh, very good uh, mechanisms to really fund that whole collection and, and, and channelization operation. So many ways to implement EPR and a lot of experiences that we can learn from in India as well. Over to you, Kaushik. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dipali. Uh, I think uh, very, very important points coming out there, I think, uh, on, on the different models of EPR and, and, and their modalities. Now, uh, with this, we move on to the Q&A session. And uh, these are questions that we've crowdsourced from the participants who have registered. And uh, the, the uh, understanding here is that uh, we've got them shared while uh, the participants have registered with us. Uh, we kind of, we've kind of curated these questions and, uh, you know, uh, so that we can have it, uh, you know, addressed to each of our participants, uh, our, our panelists. So, uh, Pankaj, uh, uh, in, in your presentation, I think uh, you'd, you'd covered uh, the need for definitions and, and uh, the regulations around it. Um, uh, I would want you to explain the importance of uh, setting up processing infrastructure. Now, uh, what are your opinions on that? Um, I'll just take a quick minute in terms of the definition while I gave you an example of, uh, you know, how these definitions vary from each state to state. I think at the central level there, we need to have a consistent uh, definition for single use plastic. And um, uh, on a high level, uh, I think few of the questions have, I was uh, glancing through the questions and few of the questions have come around this. I think one was from Rajat and uh, 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 Devika, they were looking at some of the case studies and some of the examples where uh, recycling won't be good enough. Uh, so I, I do agree there that, uh, you know, the, uh, we, we cannot just recycle uh, single-use plastic. So um, it, it has to be done, uh, defined in a manner uh, with the aspect that the, uh, the, uh, the single-use plastic which should be banned, the single-use plastic which could be uh, recycled with the EPR, uh, you know, provisions. Uh, the single-use plastic, which could not be recycled, has to be uh, recovered. Uh, and the last, uh, uh, through basically either um, the road construction mechanism, using it in the road construction, or um, using it as a co-processing in the cement kilns. And lastly, the single-use plastic, which we should uh, take into consideration and uh, 
um, uh, should be exempt from the banning as such. As far as the processing is concerned, I mean, uh, the, the typical um, waste processing hierarchy is being, should be followed, which is, you know, first you try to reuse and recycle, followed up by recovery. There has been, there have been quite uh, a few exciting uh, implementation in this regard. For an example, uh, last year, uh, a big uh, uh, reliance actually, uh, they, they have started using textile uh, from the pet bottles. Uh, additionally, this year they, they have started uh, using uh, the non-recyclable single-use plastic uh, and providing as a standard uh, mix uh, for road construction purposes. Uh, then uh, uh, last year with the call from our Prime Minister, Mr. Modi, uh, on October 2nd, I, uh, there was uh, basically a Ravan created with the single-use plastic and it was ultimately used as a co-processing in the cement cans. And then, of course, uh, uh, there are the other options, which are uh, the plastic to fuel through pyrolysis or polycrack, um, which are existing technologies. There, there is still a lot of work need to be done uh, because it needs certain homogenized uh, and segregated plastic waste. But those are exciting area. And uh, from Hyderabad, I, I'm particularly aware of uh, another uh, case study where uh, they have used the single-use plastic to create uh, 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 blocks uh, as well as the payment blocks uh, which are used for construction of toilets as well as uh, uh, footpath. So those are some of the exciting ways where uh, while the recycled plastic would always have value, it's uh, the main issue comes with uh, the small and non-recyclable plastic of a low value plastic which needs these kind of you know recovery uh, mechanism uh, uh, to get some values out of these. Right, right. So I, I think that that was a, um, you know, the, the inclusion of uh, paver blocks, uh, that is something that has uh, happened here in Hyderabad. And also the research which is happening on the plastic to fuel front, you know, uh, with, with more and more plants coming up, I think that's, that's another uh, interesting area. Uh, the other question that we had was, uh, what is the role, uh, you know, what, what role can the leadership uh, at the city level play to operationalize EPR? Now, uh, Shailendraji, I think you're well placed to kind of take up this question. Now, uh, I think the angle from which this is being posed is uh, in case we have uh, the city leadership who wants to take action as far as EPR is concerned, engage with brands, uh, you know, do we have regulations that provide for such actions? Uh, can they kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, proactively engage with brands to have implementation done at the city level? Right. Uh, thanks for that. I think, you know, it's one thing is very clear is that the first point of contact with the plastic resource, I don't like to use the word waste, happens at the consumer or the waste generator level, followed by Safai workers, rag pickers, etc. So in my mind, the ULBs, if I can call them, uh, and, and of course, uh, the ward counselors. Um, and so in my mind, ULBs, uh, in my mind, is the leadership at the city level is where most of the actions need to occur. And they can play a very a key role in the operationalization of EPR, which I think uh, CPCB also realized. And therefore, you see in their formats that now they have started asking uh, detailed action plans and recommending that brands uh, even connect with these ULBs. But the more important point, and uh, I get puzzled when uh, some of the uh, some of the officials, city officials, say, "How can I approach?" All you have to do is uh, read page 61, point number 17 of the solid waste management rules, where it's very, very clearly written. Uh, and in, in that document, uh, there are several uh, duties of various constituents of the value chain, very detailed written. And I'm just reading um, from that and allow me a couple of minutes. All manufacturers of disposable products such as tin glass, blah, blah, blah brand owners, who introduce such products in the market shall provide necessarily financial assistance to local authorities for establishment of waste management system in there. I think, I think where we are missing is the ability to connect some of these laws and you know, kind of, you know, we want to make a uh, draw from various sources. So uh, is it about authorization by law or is it about ownership? That's a separate uh, discussion that needs to happen. Um, in a city like Indore, it was both. Uh, but from my mind, top five things that they can do to help the cause. First, start to record data of waste generated by household 
This, by the way, is a gap internationally. Uh, in, in India, we even lack more authentic data and there's no better source than to start collecting data grounds up. Second, implement at least a two bin policy, two bin separation policy, wet waste, dry waste at every household. Several of the cities like Indore, Pune, they have implemented this very well. Ensure that waste collection vehicles have two bins because you collect in two bins, but you dump it in one bin in, in the waste collection vehicle. Mobilize and implement wet waste composting at RWAs and societies. This is uh, starting to become more of uh, a, a thing where I know um, increasingly municipalities are saying, if you generate organic wet waste, you, you make sure that you, um, you know, address it in, in the place that you stay. Uh, lastly, and, uh, and more importantly, I think what we also need to be uh, looking at is, is to reach out, you know, a simple thing to reach out to corporates, NGOs, and other private bodies to form at a ward level action plan to assess gaps. It all starts at that small unit and, and you'll be surprised at the amount of data that the ward councillors have. And they have a good resource also of a team that takes care of a ward within a municipality. This will, I think, start to provide you know, some baselining and, and uh, get you some challenges uh, of how things can be. I can go on, but in the interest of time, I limit my comments to this point. Thanks. Sure. sure. I think I think uh, the need is to kind of holistically look at rules, like you mentioned, both waste and plastic waste rules together yeah. can can kind of give more solutions to the doubts that. Yeah. You, you know, and to some question on the chat, is it delinking? You know, it's part of solid waste, like it or not. That's how it comes into the waste stream. So we got to address that uh, in totality. Sure. Sure. <clears throat> Uh, this is this is the next question that we've received is something from a lot of our uh, uh, Indian participants. Could you could you share instances from international experience where incentives by brands have about positive transformation in implementing EPR? And uh, I thought uh, you know Deepali could kind of address this question. So happy to jump in there, Kaushik. Um, I mean, international experience, uh, you know, across packaging, uh, you know, there are many, many uh, ways to uh, create incentives. Uh, you know, one of the very successful ways, uh, and, and this is not only limited to one or two brands, but this is, you know, generic across uh, the industry in a way, is through deposit refund schemes for beverage containers. And, you know, I can give you an example from Switzerland, uh, where I was studying. And um, when I was studying in 2004, uh, 2003, or uh, you had a very low collection rate uh, of pet bottles. And then this deposit refund scheme was introduced and suddenly, you know, they are now nearly at 80, 90% uh, beverage bottles collected, pet bottles collected in a very clean stream. And, and this is like really not, uh, you know, uh, change the consumption in, 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 in that sense of beverages uh, because, uh, it's, it's only a small little fee. It's, it's you know, a few pesce in, in Swiss currency. Uh, and, and it's uh, helping still create those incentives to put the bottles in the right place. It's not only about the money. Of course, there's a lot of, you know, uh, consumer awareness that goes behind. There's a lot of electric infrastructure. You know, it's very convenient to put it in the right bin. You know, you're absolutely right. You need to have those right collection systems. Uh, so, so there is a lot of, uh, you know, uh, elements that have, you know, brought that uh, uh, success, but it is possible. And, you know, that is, you know, one of those uh, success stories of EPR in that sense, uh, because the brands came together, they set up their PROs, you know, made sure that they can, you know, implement this, roll this out, etc. cetera. Uh, there are other, you know, examples of, uh, you know, having small charges. Uh, and I saw there was a question on this as well, uh, you know, on the Q&A, uh, which, uh, which, which includes actually, you know, not just, you know, at the recycling end, so not at the end of pipe, but also, you know, reducing the, the need for packaging. And, and, you know, there are many companies that have reduced, um, you know, their packaging content and as a result have lower fees to pay, uh, you know, under the, the EPR regimes. Uh, you know, France has a lot of, uh, you know, experience in, in what they call eco-modulation, where their fees are modulated to 
the environmental impacts in a way. So if you have a greener product, if you have more recycled plastic content, if you have lesser packaging, etc., you have lower fees, lower EPR fees. So, so there are definitely ways and, you know, experiences that this transformation mm -hmm. uh, you know, in, in waste management through EPR can be implemented very successfully. Right. I hope that gives a few examples. I, I'm, I'm very conscious of the time and I'm sure there are a lot of questions. So yeah. uh, I, I leave it over to you, Koshik, but I'm happy right. to Thank you, Dipali. Thank you. Uh, uh, another two questions before we jump into live questions. Uh, you know, countries like Malaysia have come out with a robust phase out plan for the single use plastics. Uh, Pankaj, now that we've, we've spoken so much about the single use plastics, can you throw some light on how a, a phase out strategy could help us achieve a single SUP free status in India? Sure. Uh, so uh, I, I think uh, what Malaysia and any other country or any city needs to do uh, if they want to phase out is first of all, you know, uh, divide it and uh, basically start with the target of the most problematic single use plastic. I, I would go back to what uh, Shalindraji was suggesting that you should know your waste uh, before you try to tackle the problem. So unless you know what is the most problematic area, you're not going to be able to solve everything all together. So you need to identify uh, and as earlier I suggested that start with the problematic uh, uh, aspects of the waste, uh, move towards uh, what, what is uh, the problem area and how to solve that in the, in the sense that the socioeconomic impact that if you want to completely stop how it's going to impact um, uh, the livelihood of people. And then engage with the stakeholder, uh, raise the public awareness, uh, alternatives. I mean, you would want to take something away, but you need to provide your, uh, uh, the citizens with an alternative and uh, substitute this with enough incentive so that the value chain mm -hmm. will move towards uh, a new uh, development of the new alternative with the support to the research and development. Um, you, you will not be able to completely phase uh, out plastic uh, in an year or uh, completely stop it one day. It, it, it needs on its own a transition period whereby you need to identify the products which you could uh, start, uh, stop from day one. Like for an example, in Malaysia's case, they, they, start, they have started with uh, stopping uh, the production and the use of uh, straws. It's really simple. And then they, they, they expanded with introducing new uh, other single-use plastic products into that definition and doing it in a phase-wise manner. They were divided into phases. And throughout these phases, they, they are continuously uh, working with their stakeholders, uh, educating them, um, also ensuring that there, there is a, a penalty and a fee associated. So even if somebody wants to use it, they, they need to be accountable for it. And with the support mechanism uh, of uh, uh, incentives and policies and combine that to reinforce plus with the regular monitoring and uh, adjusting your strategy accordingly. So once you uh, take care of these aspects, be it a country or be it a city or be it a state, you'll be able to become, uh, do it in a phased manner. Thanks, 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 Pankaj. I think planning is key. Um, another question which we've kind of consolidated from a number of our uh, participants is, uh, has there been any success stories as far as EPR in India is concerned? So Shailendraji, if you could share something that you had in mind in terms of success stories that we can share with our participants. Yeah, yeah, and, and uh, there have been, I mean, um, uh, absolutely there are, I can go on and on, but I think the couple of them which are quite notable uh, amongst Indian corporates is uh, Dabur that comes to mind. Uh, in fact, uh, they are possibly the only company in India that's actually gone public and the CEO of the company has said that uh, we will be a plastic waste neutral company, I think, by 2021. Uh, I've seen their, uh, their EPR uh, action plan and what they have done. And, and they have a um, uh, so job, including uh, creating awareness, working with rag pickers, working with ULBs, all the classical things that a responsible purpose-driven brand ought to be doing. Um, there are other examples uh, the, the, where, uh, you know, the notable ones, and they are also the most castigated, I think, are uh, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Mondelez, Procter & Gamble, uh, who have... Uh, who have actually, and, and many of these brands have actually come together 
to sort of learn from each other in terms of what the best practices are. Uh, there are two other uh, companies that I want to make special mention of. One of them is Hindustan Lever and the other is ITC. Both have actually gone beyond the call and the spirit and the letter of the law and actually, you know, uh, 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 adopted municipal wards. They have uh, programs where they are working with rag pickers. They are understanding what the realities and challenges are on the ground. So uh, uh, there are several, uh, what I would say, good examples uh, that we can, you know, uh, learn from um, uh, from from these. Uh, no. Most of these were driven by their own uh, stuff. You know, they they did not look at uh, the law. Isn't very clear or specifically mentioned. Sure. Thank you, thank you, Shalini. Uh, one other question, which which I thought was very closely linked with uh, Deepali's scope of work, is uh, uh, Deepali. Given your experience working with the EPR implementation with eBased in India, uh, what are the synergies that we could uh, kind of uh, uh, you know, gather from e-based and plastic-based EPR implementation and the learnings that we could carry, uh, if you could throw some light. Sure, gladly, uh, Kashik. So, uh, I mean, you know, the e-based uh, rules, uh, you know, for those, uh, you know, not familiar with that, uh, were first uh, notified in India in 2011 and came into force in 2012. And then they were amended in 2016 and then, uh, you know, or actually they went through a very uh, drastic revision in 2016 and then further amended in 2018. So there has been a little bit of a longer history of implementing these uh, rules and, and they were the first rules to kind of adopt the EPR principle. And you know, one of the, the learnings has been that uh, you need the industry to come collectively in advance, uh, you know, to set things in order to get their, you know, ducks in a row in a way to be able to preempt the kind of uh, restrictive systems that have then, you know, uh, been needed, uh, you know, to, uh, to force the industry into action. So by, you know, collectively organizing themselves, by collectively taking actions, putting, uh, you know, a system together, whether you call it a PRO, whether you call it individual systems, etc., uh, you know, that has, uh, you know, been something that, the industry has missed the bus on, uh, you know, the electronics industry, but, you know, the, the packaging industry and especially, you know, uh, consumers uh, or large users of, of plastics can really organize and, you know, are in a position to really influence the system that is then developed. The second thing that has worked really, uh, you know, with the EPR implementation under e-waste rules is targets. And, you know, until there were no targets, uh, you know, the implementation was very weak. There was very little... Um, incentive to comply or, you know, it was maybe a disincentive to comply in a way because the, uh, the very few companies that complied were the ones, you know, in uh, being scrutinized. And there were very few sanctions if you didn't. Uh, and and uh, now with targets, you know, there has been a lot more focus. It's, you know, uh, it's consolidated the industry. It's brought budgets into the whole discussion. Uh, you know, it is, you know, as, as Shailin Prithvi mentioned, now a topic that is discussed at the board level, you know, what is our EPR strategy, there has been better enforcement of the rules. So uh, I think those are some of the learnings from the e-waste rules that could be, you know, relevant for, uh, you know, implementing plastic, uh, you know, waste and, and beyond plastic, actually, I mean, plastic is just one, you know, aspect of packaging. And, you know, I, I would think that, you know, Plastics can be, of course, you know, the front runner, but you would need to cover the rest of the packaging uh, streams as well, you know, whether it's cardboard, paper, uh, you know, other things, so uh, glass and stuff. So, yeah, maybe that's a, a few quick inputs. Uh, happy to take other questions, uh, you know. I know we're running sure. out of time, so. Yes, yes, Nipali. Yes, uh, I, I would also like to mention that we are, we are uh, very, very out of time here, but then, uh, you know, with the sheer volume of questions we're getting, uh, you know, I would just want to extend this by just 10 minutes so that we could just accommodate a couple of more relevant questions. Uh, Shweta, with your, uh, with your consent. Thanks. Uh, so uh, another question which has been very, very interesting is the EU directive that has come out on single-use plastics. Now, uh, the directive on the single-use plastic has some very practical inclusions. It says that the single-use plastic beverage container caps and the lids has to be attached with the container until the product's end use. And uh, it also includes some targets like 25% uh, uh, of recycled content to be utilized as far as manufacturing these bottles are concerned. 
by 2025 and 30% uh, by 2030. Uh, so uh, Pankaj, if you could kind of address what key learnings could we take or gather from these directives like you, it's uh, of course gold standard like Shailendra ji mentioned uh, the other day. So uh, what, what do we have to gain from these directives? I think um, uh, you, you kind of place the answer in your question itself, which is basically look at uh, from the circular side uh, of, uh, 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 look at the designing of your mm -hmm. products, make it more sustainable. So uh, th there itself lies the key. Uh, I mean, unless a product is made uh, in itself uh, sustainable, more uh, circular, uh, uh, th there would always be this issue of actually uh, addressing the end of life of that particular product. So that's where uh, the main focus of this directive is. The second part is that uh, also, I mean, uh, designing might take long, so you might have to you know, adjust the existing uh, aspects of your uh, the products that we have the second part is uh, if we can bring the circularity in the production processes itself uh, and combine that with uh, the whole product value chain this uh, plus the target driven approach i think one of the questions were also asked and i, I think it's quite relevant which is um, we don't have any set targets as far as uh, you know the single use plastic uh, is concerned or in the plastic based management rules, uh, especially focusing on how, how to tackle this uh, aspect of uh, products. So there, um, you know, putting up a directive, uh, I think the goal minded approach would always work better rather than uh, putting rules and regulations in place, because then uh, everybody would work towards that goal. Uh, and then uh, the additional part is to basically uh, look at from the consumer side which is the empowering the consumer and the, the buyers, uh, incentivizing them to move towards uh, alternatives. Uh, that in a way would actually create a demand kind of push, uh, whereby people uh, and the habits do change over a period of time. So those are the few learnings I would uh, like to mention. I'm happy to address more. I think- Sure, uh, sure. thanks Pankaj. I, I think the time for the environment is kind of very key. I think that's a very pertinent point that we kind of gather from this. Um, uh, one other question that we would want to pick before going for one last question is, uh, uh, can we work on a mechanism for ground truthing for EPR achievements reported by brands? Now, uh, of course we have one side of complying uh, to these requirements. The other side is looking at ground truthing of you know, what achievements are being claimed by brands. So the question revolves around, can we work on a mechanism to have this done uh, to ensure that there is sound monitoring and verification? Uh, Shailendra ji? Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. And there was a related question. Somebody said, what about plastic credits? And I think uh, this, this uh, uh, area of ground truthing clearly is an important area and needs to be fixed. Um, not just from point of view of proving to the uh, pollution control boards how much you collected, etc., and how much did you appropriately dispose of, but also from internal brand corporate uh, audit requirements. Uh, that, as everyone knows in India, the ecosystem around waste is quite informal. Plastic waste, sorry, I use the word waste, is very informal. Uh, many small traders, crab dealers, so it's uh, you know it's something that lends itself very easily to fraud. Um, so, some of the things that uh, are being practiced today, uh, first of all, I think you have to select the right PRO if you're working with the PRO, check their antecedents, check people, check their work culture, have tight agreements and penalties in place. On the ground, what I know that uh, uh, things like e chalans, geo tagged pictures of waste, delivery receipt chalans at point of pickup and point of discharge, way bridge slips. Photographs of the truck driver waste are now commonly used. Uh, some leading brands are also reaching out to consulting firms and hiring their assurance services because they report uh, some of this activity as part of their uh, wider sustainability actions. Uh, digitization uh, is another way some brands are approaching this with real time uh, tracking moments of the value chain players, uh, stock of materials, where is lying, uh, how much is lying where, etc. And I believe personally that a blockchain eventually will find its way uh, as it has done in some other countries. Uh, lastly, I just want to say that there's a need for an independent body uh, possibly to be set up and be an active part of the system so that you, know, you get assurance and 
uh, and and you do the ground truthing, and that actually will lay the foundations of a plastic credit system. Right, right. Thank you, Shailendraji. I think uh, I think we're really running out of time, and uh, you know, as we come to an end of this discussion, uh, I would want to have some final remarks from our uh, panelists. Um, I think uh, Dipali, uh, could we have uh, some remarks from you, please? I think for me, uh, you know, this is really an interesting time. Uh, you know, the the whole reset button, uh, you know, uh, being pressed uh, yes. in terms of you know how we look at. Many, many, many things. Uh, what were maybe holy cows, and that could not be questioned. You know, we have the ability to have the chance now to really question that, and 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 really set up those systems which will, you know, be more resilient, and you know, have those kinds of safeguards and and uh, you know, uh, conscious uh, decisions being made to create those closed loops. Uh, you know, taking into perspective the whole resource perspective. You know, not that you know it's it's uh, you know. Just the linear model, as we call it, much more circular. So, uh, I think uh, this is a great time, and I'm really glad that so many people joined us. So, thank you for you know your interest and your time, and uh, you know I'm happy to uh, you know be also contacted uh, offline if if there are other questions. And uh, you know I I think it's a it's a chance for us to change direction, and uh, would love to help and support over there. So, thanks a lot for organizing this uh, Kaushik and Shweta. Very well. Thank you, Dipali. Pankaj? Um, likewise, as Dipali, I would like to reiterate what Dipali said that I'm happy to be contacted. We can take a lot of, uh, uh, we can work and collaborate more. Uh, and uh, the interest shown by uh, people here, I, I'm, I'm completely at awe. So thank you so much for taking uh, this time and coming forward. Um, in this COVID times, I think there are some conversations going on in the questions which are like, are we going to take a back seat? And the way uh, you people have shown your enthusiasm, I don't think we'll be taking a back seat. We'll be taking a, a further step ahead, which would be the need of the R, uh, uh, taking care of the waste in current scenario. Uh, and I would like to uh, end up with, keep up the good work and uh, we'll touch base at some other time, some other place. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Pankaj. Shailindraji. Yeah, thanks again uh, for everyone's uh, time and patience hearing us out. Couple of uh, three things I want to leave the audience with. One, uh, you know, there is a national resource policy that's being developed uh, that will over uh, arch over uh, all resources and, and waste, as we call it today, will soon become a resource. So um, you start to got, you know, it, the system isn't perfect, but we need to work together and make it, uh, make it happen. Uh, and then lastly, you know, somebody asked a question, what can a consumer do or what can a citizen do? And then I say this and it's my vision that we talk about EPR, but could we talk about something like ECR, which is extended citizenship, citizen responsibility or consumer responsibility. Of course, we need to arm them uh, with, with basic information, but it all starts uh, at that unit when you start treating what you generate in your households or in uh, in restaurants and other places uh, as a resource and not as a waste. Thank you so much. And uh, I'd also like to wish all the attendees to be safe. Um, and I wish their loved ones uh, remain safe during these really trying times. Thanks, thank uh, Shalindaji. Thank you, Shalindaji. As well. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Shalindaji. Uh, thank you. This has been very useful. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, we really hope you found the session interesting. Uh, thank you once again to all our panelists, Ms. Dipali, Mr. Pankaj Arora, uh, Mr. Shailendra Singh, um, Shweta, of course. Um, as we come to an end of this webinar, I would also like to inform you that this is going to be a series of ongoing webinars. Uh, do join us on our next session. Uh, over to Shweta. Hey, folks. Uh, thanks a lot. Thank you to everybody. First of all, thanks a lot for the panelists uh, for having taken this time out to put this together. And thank you, Kaushik, for uh, working hard on organizing and getting everyone on the same page. Uh, we know, I would like to mention this to all the attendees. I know that I think there's quite a few questions that all of you have which have not been answered. So uh, one is you can write to us at connect at wastewise.be. Apart from that, what I'm going to do is we are going to create a thread on our LinkedIn, uh, on our LinkedIn page where we will be tagging all the panelists. And uh, please 
feel free. We will ensure that at least a few of the questions are answered over there. And let's keep that thread alive so that uh, this conversation can be ongoing. And before we close for today, I just want to put a reminder out there that end of this month, we have a panel where Adam Reed, our uh, regular moderator and contributor, is going to be interviewing David Palmer Jones, who, is said, who was named the winner of Resource Magazine's Hot 100 in the space of waste and sustainability. So please sign up for it. It's already been listed on our website as well as on Zoom. So please ensure you, can re you register for that as well. So thanks a lot, folks, and have a good day wherever you are. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah.